get started. George Floyd was murdered on May 25, less than three weeks ago. And so much has happened over these three weeks. There have been protests, demonstrations, not only in the US, but around the world. But more than that, this has brought to a conversation about the existence of anti-racism, anti-black racism, and racial inequality in the US and many other countries and many other societies. Many Canadian activists for Black Lives Matter have taken this moment to remind us that Canada also has a recent history of racial inequality that should not be ignored. Our speaker, Jelly Massa, will explore ideas of power and privilege. She will give us a history of anti-black racism from a Canadian perspective and offer ideas on how we as non-black Muslims can offer support and solidarity. Jelly has been busy on her other speaking engagements as a mother of two, <laughs> you know, this, despite being a mother of two and all the family responsibilities, she has agreed at very short notice to come and talk to us because she's so passionate about this. And the subject is so important. Hillary is an accomplished community leader and human rights advocate with over 10 years of community engagement and community education experience. She has developed and delivered training to educators, police boards, and other community agencies on anti-operation. She currently is a human rights and outreach officer at the Toronto District School Board. Thank you so much for listening to me. Just to give a quick introduction to Jewelry, I've taken up about six to eight minutes of your time. Okay. But now over to you. Your message is more important than what I had to say. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to take up space. It's very, it's beautiful to see that even in a time where we have to physically isolate that um, the community is finding ways to come together. And I've been doing a bit of a Joffrey circuit this week. I, on Wednesday, I did the, the youth group invited me to speak. And we had over 200 um, participants in that session. On Friday, I did uh, a session with about talking to your children about race with Sister Marzia Hassan and the um, Jaffrey Social Services. Um, and then now you, so thank you so much for um, giving so much space to this, uh, I think, important topic. Um, as was, was mentioned, my name is Jillary Massa. Um, as my day job, I work, as was mentioned, the, in the Human Rights Office at the Toronto District School Board. Um, I spent some time previous to that working at the National Council of Canadian Muslims, um, doing advocacy work. Um, and, on, and on the side, I kind of engage in this, these conversations about anti-Black racism, about inclusion, um, around organizational change for diversity um, and so we will we will get into it um, so sorry Jelly, uh, yep. your head is uh, cutting off can you that's just okay. adjust your camera yes oh, that's great okay thank you sorry no Continue, problem. Please. um so i guess i it, how I'm connected to the community. I um, grew up in the Jaffrey uh, Islamic Center space, um, went to East End Madrasa. My mother converted to Islam when I was uh, four years old. My family is originally from Panama, which is a small country between Costa Rica and Colombia in, uh, in Central South America, um, and identify as Afro-Latina, which means that um, my ancestors come from Africa via the slave trade and um, are indigenous um, also to Central America. Not sure exactly what tribe because often those histories got, get lost um, as the time goes on. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're, we'll get right um, into it. Okay, so um, today's agenda, we'll, talk, we'll do an introduction on the topic. We'll talk about anti-Black racism in Canada. Oh, I, I didn't share my screen properly because I have a video. So I need to press this button. 
Um, we'll talk about anti-Black racism in Canada. Uh, we'll talk about what Islam says about race as a form of a reminder. And then we'll talk a little bit about the anti-Black racism um, within the Shia community as a way to, to discuss what does allyship and anti-racism look like um, and how can we build communities that are anti-racist and, um, and really inclusive. Um, I always like to start with uh, acknowledgement of the land that we are on and acknowledgement of Indigenous people. Um, so we can never work to end systemic and institutional violence if we do not center the narratives of Indigenous peoples in our collective decision making for social justice and equity. As settlers in Turtle Island, also known as Canada, we directly benefit from colonization and genocide of the Indigenous people of this land. In order to engage in resistance and solidarity against injustice inflicted on Indigenous peoples, it's imperative that we constantly engage in acts of decolonization. It's important to acknowledge that we are on the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And I think that whether or not we are doing work on anti-Islamophobia or on anti-Black racism or um, on anything to do with race or justice, uh, it is always uh, a, a good reminder to think about what are the ongoing systems of oppression that are impacting the first peoples um, in, this, in this country, the Indigenous people of this country. Um, I also, you know, think it's important to um, reflect on some of the many ways that race is talked about in um, in our holy book and the holy Quran, and this is one verse of many. So it's a room chapter 30 verse 22 says, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your language and your colors. Barely in that are signs for the people of knowledge. Um, and I'm always in awe of the way that Allah um, knows his creation so well that we would be grappling with these issues and um, that it was needed in the Quran to talk about race and our nation's differences of nations and tribes and languages and colors um, and give us some guidance of how we um, must engage and, and know one another. So it's always challenging to talk about race. I joked on my Wednesday um, session that I was a little bit nervous. I, you know, I do this for a living, but I was nervous to speak with this community in particular about anti-Black racism um, because, you know, unfortunately, I have my own experiences within the community being Black and Muslim, um, and. Uh, was nervous about how it would be received or, or interpreted. Um, and so I do have some guiding principles that I share with groups whenever I talk um, uh, in hopes that you will keep this in mind as we go through the presentation and as we engage in conversation. So have the courage and wisdom to recognize our connection and value our differences. We all have very different experiences. Um, you know, many of you come for it with stories and, um, and hurt and, uh, you know, as you as you transitioned and came to this country, and those are stories that are important that we all need to to hear about. Um, I I encourage you to adopt a stance of wonder rather than judgment. This is something that first and foremost is a reminder for myself because often when we're trying to digest or understand these issues um, and our differences of opinion, our differences of you know how we're positioned. Um, the reaction might be, oh my goodness, this person's just a racist. And um, rather than that, I always like to remind myself, first and foremost, to think about where and why ha is this opinion coming from? What has, who has hurt you? What has been the challenges that you have come up against that maybe um, have preconditioned you to think this way about uh, the community that I belong to? Um, uh, befriend disagreement and discomfort. Often that's where growth happens. Recognize and understand how my identity affects what I know and what my relationships are. Um, and obviously challenge with respect, which I'm sure that all of us will, um, will honor and embody these principles on a regular basis. So when we're talking about anti-racism, um, often there is a continuum. So you know, we start with does racism exist here uh, and then go to how do we challenge um, how do we challenge racism? Um, but unfortunately, I think that very um, too often do we get stuck in kind of the circular motion of does racism exist here, just answering this question. Um, and it becomes kind of almost performative that we never uh, really delve into what can our institutions, what can we do to actually challenge the racism that exists in our country um, so I, and, our, and in our communities. So I am going to spend some time talking about 
answering this question, does racism exist here? Uh, and then spend the, the, the last part talking a little bit about how do we challenge it and what work do we need to do as a community to challenge um, the, the unfortunate instances of racism that we are not immune to. So to begin, a uh, definition of anti-Black racism um, is, uh, is defined here as policies, practices rooted in... <laughs> Anti-Black racism defined here as policies and practices rooted in Canadian institutions, such as education, healthcare, and justice, that mirror and reinforce beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, stereotypes, and or discrimination towards people of Black and African descent. The term anti-Black racism was first expressed by Dr. Akua Benjamin, a Ryerson social work professor. It seeks to highlight the unique nature of systemic racism on Black Canadians and the history as well as experiences of slavery and, decolon and colonization of Black African, Blacks of African descent in Canada. So I'm going to show a quick video um, to give some context. DeAndre Campbell. Michael Elligan, Dwayne Christian, just three of many black Canadians involved in use of force cases involving police in Canada, each one under the age of 30, each story a tragedy related to hundreds of years of history before Canada was even a nation. In 1834, Canada became the terminus of the Underground Railroad, a secret network that helped bring some 30,000 enslaved men, women and children from the United States to relative freedom. But freedom did not mean equality. Africville on the outskirts of Halifax was a black community dating back to 1848. For decades, the city of Halifax refused to provide residents clean drinking water. By 1970, the city had relocated all of Africville's residents. Some of them were moved in garbage trucks. The computer center riot has gained an almost mythical stature as a turning point for race relations in Canada. In 1969, students at what is now known as Concordia University in Montreal barricaded themselves in a computer room on campus to protest discrimination by a prof against six black students. The legacy of trauma lives on today. When video surfaced of Justin Trudeau in blackface in the 1990s, even the PM admitted he wasn't aware of how racist the act was. It was something that uh, I didn't think was racist at the time, but now I recognize um, it was something racist to do, and I am deeply sorry. What's worse, the myths persist even today. The idea that Canada is somehow immune to widespread racism. Listen to Doug Ford last week. Thank God that uh, we're different than the United States. And we don't have the systemic, deep roots they, they have had for years. And to Quebec Premier Francois Legault, who was either ignorant of history or chose to ignore it. I don't want us to compare ourselves to the United States. We have not experienced slavery in the history of the United States. Both eventually conceded racism exists, but their comments still reflect a lack of awareness about our own history. Sadly, that comes as no surprise to Andrea Davis, Associate Professor of Black Cultures of the Americas at York University. I think that our leaders don't, don't really have that excuse of saying, well, I wasn't taught this in school, because it's their responsibility to know the histories of the people they represent. It's their responsibility to know the, the societies that they represent. And it, again, if we're going to keep saying that this is a multicultural society, then it's upon us, all of us, to really genuinely seek to know each other. So what does black um, anti-black racism look like in Canada? The video um, articulates it quite well. Um, the stigma and stereotypes of black Ontarians in community space have impacted public policies, decision making and services. And as a result, in nearly every measure of opportunity, security and fairness in our society and anti-black racism is felt. Black children are more likely to be in foster care or enrolled in lower academic streams. I work for a school board at the Toronto District School Board and um, it is documented and we have done data collection that, that 
um, illustrates this, that disproportionately young black men, black, young black boys in particular, are streamed out of um, academics to be able to access higher uh, post-secondary education. Black men are more likely, and, and I mean to, to kind of frame this, this happens often um, as soon as a black student enters um, the school system in junior kindergarten. Um, and I've heard studies, stories of within the first week, um, teachers encouraging parents to put young children, uh, black children in, uh, in special education uh, with no real understanding about what the potential of that student is. Black men are more likely to interact with the justice system than their white counterpart, counterparts at, level, at all levels of society. Black women are more likely than white women to be unemployed or underemployed despite having higher levels of education. 8.8% .8 of black women with a university degree are unemployed compared to 5.7% of white women in, with high school diplomas. And this is from the Ontario Anti-Black Racism Strategy uh, research that was done a few years ago after um, the, some high profile killings of um, black men here in the GTA. In 2018, the report from the Ontario Human Rights Commission found that Black residents in Toronto are 20 times more likely to be killed by police than white people. Black residents in Toronto only make up 8.8% of the city's population, but account for 61% of cases in which police used force that led to death at 70% of all cases where a police shooting resulted in a death. The practice of criminalizing Black people in particular dates back to when slavery was legal in Canada, only um, being officially abolished in 1834. Um, when slavery was abolished, it was institutions that took on the role of exerting control um, over Black people. So often, you know, the conversation has surrounded around reforming the police, reforming institutions, but the, what re needs to be recognized is that there is a history of slavery um, in Canada that we don't talk about in our education system, um, but also that many of the institutions that we now know to keep us safe, like the police force, like the RCMP, um, in their original inception were about exerting and control over Black people, like um, like uh, Robin Maynard, Professor Maynard has has stated that they were um, the legacy of these of these uh, institutions is that they were about um, controlling the movement of Black bodies uh, and Indigenous bodies and and really exerting control over these communities. So I know um, often we have a conversation about Canada in relation to the United States, and it feels like we have a, there's a better picture here that. Um, you know, we're at least we're not as bad. And we heard uh, Doug Ford, Premier Ford, um, you know, express that just as early as last week. We have seen over the last few weeks as protests have risen um, around the, the killing of jo or the murder of George Floyd. Um, uh, we've seen people in positions of power, um, politicians and mayors and um, police chiefs, uh, even Prime Minister Trudeau, take go to attend these protests and take the knees. Um, uh, and I, I really want to interrogate this a little bit because I think that people have been applauding um, our leaders for making these gestures without an acknowledgement that really these are the leaders that we are uh, imploring to actually do something. They have the power to change the institutions and how um, they are built. So, um, you know, there's lots of work, there's lots of research that has been done on this and a lot of kind of opinion pieces and talking points that have been put out in the media very recently that folks can, you know, do a quick search and, and find some things that, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, Ronaldo Walcott, who's a professor uh, at University of Toronto at, at OISE, says when they, politicians, take those knees in those public ways at those protests, what they're doing is they are playing to emotion, but are playing to emotion minus policy. And I think this speaks to what I, what I had just said in terms of, you know, who are they taking the knee to? I think it's a bit of, um, you know, they're, they're not reading the room, as they say, uh, because folks, what, are, what they're asking for is for their politicians, is for Justin Trudeau, is for the police chief to take action over the systemic ways that, um, that anti-Black racism show up. When he takes the knee without offering us any insight about how he intends to address the concerns and investigation of RCMP around police violence, especially against Indigenous people, he's actually not offered us anything. Um, there are, I think that right now there are six cases against the RCMP when it comes to racial discrimination. The RCMP falls under the, the jurisdiction of 
um, the federal government. Um, and so taking the knee is one thing, but it would be more impactful for the prime minister's office to be um, taking a stance and really um, reflecting on what, how policing operates in this country. In some provinces, it's not local police, like you know the Toronto police um, that, that uh, enforce law, it is the RCMP. Um, what, what, when taking the knee, what's not happening is our country is not reflecting on black students uh, and why black students, 12% of the Toronto District School Board student population represent 48% of all expulsions, why indigenous students are 0.3 of the student population and 1% of all expulsion, um, it, uh, East, while Eastern uh, Medi uh, Mediterranean South Asian students were 4% of the population, but 8% of all expulsions. So we're seeing that even in cases where the, you know, these students who are racialized and students who are Black only make up 12% of the, the, the population, but still disproportionately are seen um, in areas of expulsion. And I see this firsthand. Again, I work at a school board. I see the way in which punishment looks different depending on um, the color of your skin. Often police are called. We hear about a, a recent story at the Peel District school board where a six-year-old child um, had black child had police called on her uh, because she had an argument with her teacher and often um, it's like those are the types of arguments that if you weren't black resulted in you maybe getting sent to the office or having detention in these cases um, young black children are being treated as adults and having the police called on them it fails to address the challenges experienced by people uh, people looking for mental health resources um, and often deadly, how often deadly it is for Black folks. Um, we see the two most recent examples uh, in Toronto of Sister Regis Korchensky Paquette, um, who was Afro-Indigenous woman whose family had called the police because of a mental health crisis. Now, we still don't know exactly what transpired there. What we do know is that the family called the police the police entered, entered the apartment, didn't allow the parents to, or the family to enter with them, uh, and uh, Sister Regis ended up uh, falling off the balcony, and we don't exactly know how that transpired. We, uh, we also heard in April um, of a Black man who lived in Brampton, they called the police for help because he was also in a mental health crisis, um, and he too ended up being shot dead in front of his family. And of course, we remember Andrew Loku and Abdurrahman Abdi in, um, in uh, Ottawa, who were also black men um, who were in crisis, mental health crisis. And when the police showed up, uh, because uh, somebody called in distress, um, they lost their lives or were murdered at the hands of police. So I think it's important to, to think about this, then this is the backdrop that we're operating within. Um, when we think about systemic ways that anti-Black racism shows up. Um, so what do I mean by systems of oppression? For anybody who is familiar with kind of geography and the idea of an iceberg, an iceberg, you only ever see 10% of what is, 10% um, of the iceberg at the very top. What you don't see is kind of the things that are supporting the 10% that we do see that come at the bottom. In a very similar way, we talk about systems of oppression. Um, that it's beyond kind of these individual acts of solidarity or individual um, you know, acts of racism, uh, that really what we're talking about is how do the systems, the powerful ideas, the infrastructure, the policies, the politic of a country, of an institution, how do they uphold um, the individual issues or the issues that uh, people are impacted by? So in the same way, we have the example of George Floyd. This is what this has been the motivating factor for many of the protests and the calls to action. And even you know this this conversation has been triggered in our community because many of us saw the murder of George, George Floyd on our tablets, on our on our t televisions, on the internet. We saw it happen before our eyes, and it made it very difficult to ignore. But what we have, what we're not paying attention to, or we're not talking about, um, is all of the ways in which policy, um, and this is, you know, giving the U.S. example, but in Canada, the way in which um, different policies impact the ways Black people experience life. So, you know, in in the states, we're talking about universal health care, we're talking about starvation wages, we're talking about mass incarceration. In Canada, we're talking, we are talking about poverty, we're talking about minimum wage, we are talking about streaming in schools, we're talking about police in schools, we're talking about systems of carding, um, we're talking about, you know, a political class, uh, a polit you know, if you see the cabinet, of the Ontario government right now, you see how la it lacks diversity. So those are the types of things that we're talking about when, when we say um, we need to look at the systemic ways that oppression shows up. 
So systems of oppression are sexism, Islamophobia, racism, ableism, classism, colonization, imperialism. It also means anti-Black racism and white supremacy. And when I say white supremacy, I'm talking about the idea that white people and that their ideas, thoughts, and beliefs um, are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, and beliefs. While supr white supremacy culture is an artificial historical constructed culture which, which expresses, justifies, and binds together many of our institutions. It is the glue that binds together white controlled institutions into systems of white control, systems into the global white supremacist system. So I'm not talking about white people, you know, we all have coworkers and friends, maybe even family members who are white, who are loving and just people. But what I am talking about is what are the systems in place? What are the ideas in place that have pro propped up this country, but many of the, of the countries that we come from that say that white is the norm, is the dominant culture? Um, and what, how are these dominant groups themselves how, what are they doing to kind of dismantle ideas of who has power? How are they hoarding power and how are they benefiting from a particular system? So, you know, even within the Muslim community, I think about how white supremacy operates. How do we see race within the Muslim community? How do we see even, you know, for myself, I come from a, um, a Latin American country where even, even though most of our population looks like me, Many of us don't identify as Black, don't identify with our African ancestry because um, that is not seen as favorable. Even, you know, we will be quick to identify with the drop of European that we have. You know, they say, my, Janela, my sister has light eyes because our grandfathers or our great grandfather came from France and he had blue eyes and somehow it trickled down. So we're very quick to kind of um, uh, hold on to whatever connection we have to whiteness um, and very quick to reject our connection to blackness. There's a, there's a reason for this. Um, it's because, you know, a system of white supremacy has entrenched in all of us, even in, in communities of color, um, what is more beautiful, what is more desirable, what is more legitimate. Anti-Black racism is systemic and historically grounded discrimination towards people of African descent, also referred to as Black, and involves stereotypes, attitudes, and actions that are based on the assumption that something is inherently wrong with Black people. So I'm asking us to think about what are the assumptions, stereotypes, and attitudes that society has, has about Black people, and how has that influenced how we think or how we interact with those um, who come from Black communities. Now, we understand that Islam is a great equalizer. Um, many, many of us um, have come, to, or many of our ancestors have come to this faith, have converted to this, this faith because um, we experienced injustice ourselves, whether it was uh, at the hands of the Hindu caste system, whether it was at the hands of you know, racist governments. A lot of black communities, for example, came into Islam because they were looking for, they were looking away from Christianity that showed them a black Jesus or a white Jesus um, that was used as the excuse for their enslavement. Um, and you know, the nation of Islam uh, was really the pathway to a lot of black Muslims um, introduction to more traditional or mainstream ideas of Islam. And in the Quran, like I said before, we have lots of examples as a reminder uh, of what race and how we should think about race uh, as, a, as the Ummah. Uh, in the Quran, verse 30, 22, I read this one, among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Verily in that are signs of people of knowledge. Um, in verse 49, or in, in Surah 49, verse 13, O oh man, behold, we have created you out of a male and female and have made you into nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another. Verily the noblest in, uh, of you in the sight of Allah is the one whom, uh, who is most deeply conscious of him. Behold, Allah is all knowing and all aware. Uh, and, and we all often hear about the famous sermon from the prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him. Um, Allah, hum all humankind is from Adam and Eve, an Arab is no superior over a non-Arab, nor does a non-Arab have any superiority over an Arab, a white has no superiority over a black, nor does a black have superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. So we see lots of examples of how in our Quran, um, without needing to rely on, um, on hadith or any kind of uh, interpretation of tradition, that it's right in front of us, this, uh, this idea of um, you know, why we were made 
from different nations and tribes. A lot tells us is to get to know one another. Um, but there's also, you know, I recently came across some resources that talk about, um, you know, some of which prophets were black or of African descent and which of our imams also um, were of African descent who had black mothers. Um, and I'm still doing some research to see, you know, the, the, the validity of this, but um, there's, there are, we know that like even in the context of, of Prophet Isa, um, often these are care, these are these are individuals who are are whitewashed um, in 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 broader society, even in Christianity. Often Jesus is presented as a white man, although he came um, from the Middle East, from Jerusalem. So, but at the very least, he was a person of color. Um, so, how does racism show up in the Muslim community? Um, First and foremost, I think it shows up in the erasure of Black Muslim history. We very rarely hear about the ways in which Black Muslims have contributed to the development of Islam, contributed to the spread of Islam. Um, we hear about Haz Bilal, um, peace and blessings upon him, and that's a very noble and important story in our history. Um, but then there's a whole kind of, you know, we don't hear anything else until we get to Malcolm X. Muhammad Ali. Um, so there's a whole kind of history in between and before that we don't hear about. We don't often hear about the um, um, um Ayman. Uh, our prophet Muhammad called her mother after my own mother. She is the rest of my family. She was one of the first people, said to be one of the first people um, to convert to Islam. Um, we also don't talk about the, um, the way in which um, the king, the Christian, black Christian king of what is now known uh, to be Ethiopia, protected and, and uh, is where our holy prophet sought refuge um, from the Quraysh. It was a black man, a black Christian man um, who was very wealthy, who was not a slave, um, who took on uh, that role. We also don't hear about how Muslims have impact, how black Muslims have impacted, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the preser preservation of um, Islamic history and Islamic knowledge. And it's said that Fatima al Fari, who was an African Muslim woman, was, was the one who founded the first ever university, University of Al Karwain in, in Morocco, um, which opened in doors in 859. I believe that this structure still exists um, in Morocco. You can go and visit it, and it has over 4,000 rare books of ancient Arabic manuscripts. Um, it has a 9th century version of the Quran, uh, lots of literature on Islamic jurisprudence. So, you know, um, we never hear a Black, in the same way that in mainstream history, we never hear about the ways in which Black folks were kings and queens and intellects and inventors. Um, we, we often experience the same thing within Black, in, within Muslim history, Islamic history, where, um, where the experiences or the contributions of Black people are not um, offered to us. I did a bit of a quick survey amongst my friends, um, Black and non-Black in the Shia community about their experiences with anti-Black racism. And this is what they had to say to me. My mom used to make me wear brightening cream to get more prospects for marriage for me. This is something that I heard often, you know, jewelry, it's not only about Black people. If you're a dark-skinned um, koja, uh, and a woman, especially, you're less likely to have um, very many people coming to offer their hand in marriage. Um, dark, even within our Asian community members, is considered to be less attractive. Uh, many, you know, we hear about, you know, young girls being told, uh, or young boys even being told, don't go out into the sun, you're going to get too dark. Um, and this is about, these are the messages that people get about what standards of beauty are within our community. Um, somebody else says, always being treated like converts despite being in the religion for 21 years. This is something that I hear often. You know, some of us have been Muslim for generations. I have not. My, mom, my mother converted to Islam, but my children, you know, are born Muslim. Uh, and, you know, if they, if they grow up, if we don't change the way that things are, undoubtedly, um, they will always carry this um, this bag of a convert as if they are foreign or alien to the religion. They don't, they know less, um, which I think is an unfair characteristic considering that at one point in time, all of us have an ancestor that uh, adopted and accepted Islam. Um, but those of, of us who come from more mainstream looking uh, Muslim communities, at some point we're able to kind of um, do away with that title of convert. Um, a friend was told, uh, by ladies swimming, her curly hair looked like 
um, the hair of your private parts, which I don't know why anybody would say that in general, but to say it to a child, this was, you know, my friend um, told me this and she was, she says she was about nine years old when she was told this, which seemed really <laughs> um, problematic to me on so many levels. Being told, I like you and I wish I could, but my parents would never accept a black person. This is often um, something that comes up around kind of the racial preferences or um, the rules around who you're allowed to marry that are based on race that um, I think are con completely contradictory to what our faith teaches us. Um, when I've been told that I'm beautiful even though I'm black, my son was called the N-word by another boy while praying at Madrasa. When I asked the school to deal with it, we were ignored. Uh, and uh, being taught nothing about Black Muslim history at mosque or madrasa. So what does it look like to move towards allyship? Um, the first is to understand your own power and privilege. The second is to recognize your implicit bias. Third is to recognize that anti-Black racism in, uh, is systemic and rooted within all of our institutions, including our, our cultural and religious institutions, uh, and that we have an obligation to challenge it. Uh, and fourth is to be anti-racist and not non-racist. So we'll talk about what those things. So power and privilege, what do I mean um, by this? Um, I mean that, uh, you know, they're the things, they're, it's a system within our society that says that some, uh, some identities are normalized, some ide identities just by virtue of being that um, uh, have access to power and have access to influence. Um, more than others. So, you know, what identities do we know that are hold privilege in our society? If we think about it, if we think about, you know, what do our politicians look like? Um, often they look like white, um, they're male, they're Christian, they're rich, um, they have, you know, they're able-bodied, they have citizenship, they have an access to network and resources, um, they don't deal with mental health challenges, there's an age range that um, might fall into it. Um, it. Within our own communities, we have ideas of shadism, so light-skinned people are, um, you know, often, e even in countries like my own, where most of us are Black, our, all of our leadership is, um, you know, folks who are light-skinned, or folks who are of European descent or white, um, you know, education, if you have an education, if you speak English without an accent, these are all things that are um, privileged within our society. Now, if we look at our own community, um, you know, I think it's really important for people to reflect on how they have privilege in society, where they hold power, and how they can use it. For, so even for myself, who is a Black Muslim woman, for all intents and purposes, you know, that's an identity that doesn't have a lot of power within a society like this, that judges Muslimness, especially um, when you wear hijab, um, that uh, categorizes women in a particular way, that categorizes categorizes blackness in a particular way. However, I still have other things that give me and allow me privilege in society. I'm able bodied. So I never have to think about whether there's an elevator in a building in order to be able to access a, a room or a meeting or anything that I have to go to. I have Canadian citizenship. So I never have to deal with the precarity of not having status uh, and all of the things that don't come with uh, lack of citizenship or that come with lack of citizenship status. Um, I don't struggle with mental health issues. Um, I don't speak English without an accent, or I speak English with no accent, so um, that also gives me a, perf uh, a certain level of um, security and safety and legitimacy. I have a master's degree, so all of these things are things that give me privilege, and so I encourage you to think about when we're thinking about what do we do about this big problem. One of the things is to think about where, where do you have access to power? Where do you have access to um, to legitimacy and how can you use that power um, to change and shift the conversation. So Jiwan Chanika, who's the superintendent at equity at the TDSB, he says, our identities matter, so, is hu so humility is key. Who we are shapes the way we experience and understand the world in our relationships with others. Our identities are also complex and layered and we are more than a singular identity. In the society we live in, in some parts of our identity are privileged while others uh, over others, and this shapes how we experience the world and often what we may choose to share or not. Uh, Parker Palmer reminds us, we teach who we are. When we sit, speak, listen to each other, our identity plays a role. So we, as we listen, we must remember to think about who we are in relation to who's speaking. This will help us build deeper understandings of each other. So when I think back to the um, surah in the Quran that says, we've made you from nations and tribes so you may get to know one another, I think about, you know, what does it mean to get up to know one another? Um, what is required for us to be able to do that successfully? Um, and I think about this, it's the, I think it's about 
um, thinking about your own social status and how it relates to somebody else and how that social status might be impacting how you um, see, see others. Okay, so I'm gonna show this um, video really quickly on implicit bias um, and we'll talk about it. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times, when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old-fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm going to say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and ex Okay. So, you know, I think it's important for us to reflect on the implicit biases that we have about the Black communities within our community, our, our um, Joffrey community. What might be um, the assumptions or stereotypes that we have about them because we've been raised um, with, uh, with particular ideas about Black communities or um, kind of nonverbal cues about how to interact with Black communities. And I even think about myself, even as a Black person myself, you know, there's lots of messaging that I've received growing up that has told me to fear Black men in particular, that has told me to fear, to see um, uh, Blackness as inferior. Even within my own community, I always, I tell this joke, I don't know if I already told it, but um, in this session, but of, um, you know, my father, uh, who is Black himself, will say things like, oh, um, uh, I'm not Black, I am the darkest version of white um, because he's trying you know and he says it as a joke but I know that that's coming from somewhere that there's truth for him where he has disassociated himself from his black and African identity uh, and tried to grasp onto whatever it is um, that brings him closest to whiteness so what is a non-racist a non-racist often says things like, I don't see color. A non-racist is passively opposed to racism and takes a neutral role against it. A non-racist focuses on individual acts of racism without acknowledging the systemic ways that racism shows up. A non-racist gets defensive if you tell them that they benefit from a system of white supremacy. And I wanna remind us that all of us benefit from a system of white supremacy one way or another. Um, you know, even myself, by virtue of the fact that I speak English with no accent, um, I, I I am benefiting from a system um, and will likely get heard differently than if somebody um, who may have may even be white who has an accent may be heard. Um, a non-racist says things like, I don't see color, I treat everyone equally, and doesn't take action against racism, the racism they witness. Um, the challenge with saying I treat everyone equally is that we don't need um, equal treatment. What people need is fair treatment. Um, and so I don't know if you've seen this. Um, this kind of this cartoon where it has a picture of a fence uh, and a number of people different sizes trying to look over the fence and the person who's shortest can't see over the fence because obviously the fence you know hits everybody equally or is you know one one side and if you if you give everybody the same size box um, 
still the person who's shortest is not going to be able over the fence. So what we need to do is give everybody the size of box that they need or eliminate the fence completely in order to um, gain true equity instead of equality. What does an anti-racist do? An anti-racist sees racism as part of a larger system of oppression. They understand that race is a social construct and that has ongoing negative impact on, on the experiences of communities of color. Anti-racist understands that along with individual acts of racism, it is important to challenge and examine how systems and institutions uphold racist policies and practice. An anti-racist sees themselves as part of the problem and continues to learn and unlearn their own internalized racism. They take action to disrupt and denounce racism. They think about how they can give up their personal power in favor of hearing from racialized voices and have courageous conversations about race with the people that they love who are around them. Um, so I guess at this point, I'll stop sharing my screen um, and we can take questions and um, have a bit of a conversation if anybody um, has any thoughts or things that they'd like to say. Jewelry, that yes. was amazing. Oh, thank you. So much information in there, so much to sort of uh, think through for sure. Fantastic. Um, Asnay, do we have any questions or any comments uh, from the audience? So Bashibai Rirsi, can you go ahead? Uh, you raised your hand, so go ahead, ask your question after you unmute. Bashibai Rirsi. I unmuted myself. Uh, thank you, Asnain and uh, Najibo. And uh, thank you, Jewelry, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. I just wanted to add to the conversation that is going on right now about anti-racism. Uh, there was a program I was watching on CNN and uh, Jake Tapper, was uh, interviewing uh, Karim Abdul-Jabbar. Mm. And there was something that he said that really stuck in me. And, and this was, not all black people are criminals. Not all white people are racist. Not all cops are bad. Mm -hmm. And ignorance comes in all colors. And I think that last statement really is the crux of the matter when it comes to racism or anything else for that matter, where people have a particular view about a particular thing. It's, it's because of the ignorance that some of these things get sort of uh, brewed uh, and, um, and, and, and the prejudices spread. I just yeah. thought I'd make that comment. No, absolutely. Thank you for that comment. And I think that it's important too to root that comment in a conversation about how do systems that we operate within, how do our institutions support um, the ignorance that gets bred, right? And so when, when somebody says something like white people can't dance, I'm reflecting on, yes, that is a problematic statement to make. It's, it's, it's not a nice comment to make, it's a rude comment to make, but is it supported as well by a system of government, of education, of uh, media that tells me this story? Um, as opposed to um, young black boys are unruly and um, you know, will end up in jail. Is that supported by a system in my, in, you know, in my field, an education system that feeds into this, right? Do they get streamed in a particular way? So I'm thinking about how does how do those things coexist? The ignorant ideas, how are the ignorant ideas supported by um, systemic policy and laws um, that might impact somebody's actual ability to succeed? Thank you. Uh, Sister Fatima has a question, uh, but uh, uh, I think she's uh, still thinking about how to rephrase it. But we will ask uh, Shafiq Ibrahim to go ahead, please uh, unmute and ask your question, Shafiq. Asalaamu Alaikum, Jilari, and Asalaamu Alaikum all. Jilari, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you've suddenly given us a lot to think about. My, My question to you is how does our culture and the environment uh, in which we have been brought up play into our psyche of uh, implicit bias? Oh, it's huge. It's in all of the messaging that we, that we receive constantly, right? From the media, from the news, from music to um, the books and history that we learn from. Um, they all provide subtle messages about the differences, uh, the different ways that we see particular races. Um, and I mean, I can, I, I can speak anecdotally about the Koja community, you know, from stories that I've heard from my friends. I know that there's, um, you know, I don't know the words myself, but I know that there's even like 
w derogatory words that get, have just become colloquial that you use to um, to say to refer to somebody as black um, in Kachi and Gujarati and different things, right? Um, in the same way, in my in my language, I speak Spanish. Um, you know, we say negra, mulata, this, these words and the other that often are derogatory terms originally, but get framed in a particular way. Or even, you know, we, we in my community we talk about um, uh, cleaning the complexion. So you marry somebody who's lighter skin than you, so that your children come out lighter skin, right? Um, this is a concept that exists within my community and I know that it exists amongst other communities as well. So I think, um, you know, culturally we have a, a global culture of anti-Black racism and it shows up in different ways community to community. Um, and I'm, I'm sure those who are darker, who are Koja can tell you lots of ways of how they felt um, anti-Black racism. Okay, I, see, so I see something in the, chat jokes about dark complexion burnt is still inappropriate even if directed on ourselves i hear these jokes in our community i don't like it and i'm seen as being too sensitive i'm brushed off or told this is our community they really don't get it please present for me or speak for me somebody um, put that in a private message to me maybe i'll ask you a quick question mm -hmm. with all these protests uh, demonstrations uh, conversations more importantly so much in the media um, action is being taken for example a certain show or recordings of uh, cops the the filming and all that they, they stopped all that they said we're not going to do that anymore mm -hmm. um, when racism is so entrenched yeah in our forget the society but the systemic yeah. Do you think in Canada things will start changing? Because RCMP, the head honcho, the lady, she says yeah. there's no racism. Yeah. You talked about Quebec Premier, no racism. Yeah. Doug Ford, no racism. Right? When it is there and they don't recognize it, do you think? with all the pressures and what, whatever's happening around the world and in our country itself. Do you think time is now that people will start to look inwards and say, yeah, we do need to change. And also all the corporations, because they were there as well. School boards are way ahead. You know, they already started. In some cases. But, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think I think that's an important question. I think that for me, it's hard to like just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say like it's all it's all rooted in racism. And so what's the point? I'd like to stay hopeful, particularly because we have come a long way as a society, right? There, it was not too long ago that we had segregated school systems here in Canada. It's not not too long ago that we, you know, people the people who experience segregation and slavery, like those, that's not too far removed from our reality. Um, and so it took moments like the, this to push our society a little bit further, push them closer to a society that we, that we want to see. And so perhaps we're in a moment that will push us a little bit closer to where, where we want to be. Um, but I also think like, what are the things that we can control? I can't control necessarily how the RCMP responds um, you know, communities are pushing, act activists are pushing for our country to reflect on what policing looks like. Um, you know, where I'm hearing a lot about this concept of defunding police or reallocating but police budgets to other areas like mental health and social services. Um, you know, they're being pushed to reevaluate themselves. But I, at the same time, I'm thinking like, where, what are the things that we have access and control over? I have access and control over my family. So what am I teaching my children? right? Because inshallah, they'll grow up to be a CEO of something, maybe a prime minister, who knows what they'll grow up to be. So what are the things that they're learning around our kitchen table, the conversations that we're having to ensure that they grow up to be um, God-fearing people uh, and, and people who, um, you know, embody justice in all of their, all that they do. In our institutions, at our Islamic schools, in our public schools, in our mosques, these are places that we have a voice, we have a say, we're connected to leadership, um, so how are we pushing ourselves to think differently about how we talk about justice and race, anti-Black racism? Are we reflecting ourselves, the things that we're demanding of our bigger institutions to reflect on? Thank you. Thank you. So there's another question here. Since uh, we are discussing our community and Koja community, 
what can we do in our Koja centric community to bring about more equality and fair treatment? Basically, if you can give us a step by step guideline to promote and exercise fairness. Yeah. So Be I know. Before, you, before you answer, yeah. it, is, it is five o'clock. I'm mindful of time. We will just continue for another 10, 15 minutes. Or, uh, Hillary, I, 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 uh, sorry, Hillary, not yeah. Hillary, Hillary. Yeah. My yeah. apologies. I hope you don't mind staying on for a few no, more minutes. Not at all. Wonderful. Not at all. Thank you. Please go ahead. The question was for a step by step. Um, I think the first point is to really assess where you are. Um, how are you responding to the things that you're seeing in the news? Are you having conversations with your um, your network about the things that are ha happening in the news? Are you listening to the people within the community who are black who are saying, um, you know, there are there are jokes that are inappropriate about darker complexions. That's a problem. Um, we're not hearing about the history of black black Muslims and their contributions throughout Islamic history at Madrasa. This is a problem. Um, you know. Did the, did, does the Friday khutbah after something like the murder of, of George Floyd, is it about racial discrimination within our community or how we express solidarity outside of our community? So I, really, I, I go back to how do, we, how do we evaluate the things that we have control over and how do, we, um, how do we move to kind of pushing people in a particular way? Things, things, change doesn't happen just because somebody wakes up in the morning and decides that they want to do better. Often it's not, that's not the case. Often it happens because people come together and there's a groundswell of support for an issue. So I really think, you know, they're, they're, despite my nervousness to talk to uh, a community, um, because, you know, there's a, even my own personal bias of experience with the community, I think maybe they're too resistant, maybe they're not ready to talk about this, maybe um, they're not ready to listen to a, a Black Muslim woman about the racism that she experienced at your hands. Um, that's not the case. That has, it's been the complete opposite, actually. I've, I've had a lot of really insightful, good, reflective conversation with the community. So I think people are ready to, to, to take a good look at ourselves. Um, you know, I, I'm hearing that there's a a task force on anti-racism that's happening in the Joffrey community. These are some really important steps um, uh, to move the conversation forward. Okay, so before we go to the next question, if anybody wants to ask questions, please raise your hands or put down your question on the chat. Uh, here's a question. Mm -hmm. Many societies within Canada experience discrimination even though they are not Blacks. How can it be discussed at a high level of governance? I think that there's a spotlight on anti-Black racism right now because of the, the immediate need. Like we've seen, we've seen this horrific murder of this, this, um, this Black man, um, you know, he, it was recorded. Uh, and there's even some videos I, um, uh, that talk about like who was protecting this white police officer as he killed this black man, right? It was an Asian man, an Asian police officer who was protecting the scene. It was an Arab shop owner who called the police, right? So how do we all kind of contribute to, to these systems? So I think, you know, maybe it's not answering this question, but we are talking about anti-black racism right now because this has this is what's happened in this moment. In the same way that when we experience, our community experienced the shock of the Quebec mosque shooting, we were talking about anti-Muslim racism, we we're talking about Islamophobia in that moment. But it's not a competition. Like, it's not like there's one pie and we all, you know, there's enough pie for all of us, essentially, was what I'm saying. And a reminder that white supremacy impacts all of our communities, even white communities, right? Even white communities are grappling with what this means for themselves. How do they, how do they become allies? How, has, how have they lost their own history as well in the process of um, a system of, of domination that says that they are better than the rest of us? Um, so I think once we start seeing you know, our, the displacement of our people from our, from our home countries, once we start seeing how colonization has impacted all of us, once we start seeing the racism that um, you know, even when COVID-19 started, all of the racism that was happening against those who from, were of Asian descent about, you know, them being the carriers of this virus, stores were seeing decline in, um, in shoppers because there was, or consumers because there was, you know, this, this racism against them. So I think at every moment we should see that there are way more opportunities for allyship that while at this moment we're talking about anti-Black racism, 
um, fixing the problem of anti-Black racism will alleviate some of the challenges with racism that all of us experience, regardless of our um, racial identity. So Nazmul, we don't have any more questions. So I'm gonna pass it back to you. Nazmul, can you unmute, please? You are so right, I should unmute. I should remember that. Um, one last question. Yeah. Through the history of colonization, when generations, and I'll, I'll use the word white. Yeah. If whites have dominated the other societies and it is in their system, we talked about systemic racism. Mm -hmm. This is the institution order. But when children and everybody grows up with that kind of mental attitude, how do you change that? Well, we have to disrupt it. You have, I'm sure you have children and grandchildren, right? I have children. I'm trying to figure out how to disrupt it with my own children, right? We have our, we have a mixture of indigenous and black in our family between my husband and I. And I'm trying to ensure that they have opportunities to see themselves in all positions of power, of intelligence, of that we're, we're changing the narrative for our, for our, young, our, young, our young people. I think it, it does feel like a huge problem to solve that all, it seems like the cards are all stacked against us and there's no winning. But like I said, I'm hopeful by the fact that there are glimpses of justice we are seeing ourselves in different in diff in places that we've never seen before. We're having these this conversation in a way that we've never had it before, um, and to me, that's a glimpse of hope. And it it tells me that there is um, there is power. I I even imagine like you know apartheid South Africa when it was in the height of apartheid. Nobody ever would think that 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 Nelson Mandela would become the prime minister of that country, right? He was in jail. Many of their the ANC people were exiled, right? lots of violence, lots of brutality, um, we, people would never think that they would be in a position where they are now. And not to say that, you know, South Africa has a lot, a lot of challenges and are still dealing with the legacy of apartheid, but it is to say that change, as cheesy as it sounds, I think it's possible. I'm hopeful that, you know, through the hearts and minds, um, that we have the ability to, to let our governments know, like, how do we make race an uh, issue in election? If you have ideas that, that aren't about disrupting a system, then that's not the kind of leadership that we want. If you are open to having conversations about how we disrupt systems of oppression, whether it's racism or sexism or ableism, whatever it is, classism, how we talk about the impacts of poverty on communities, uh, how we talk about immigration and refugees, um, then that's the type of leadership that we want. We live in a democracy, right? So, at the very least, we should be using that democracy for what it's intended. You and I, we have influence over our families. The challenge is we can't influence the others. No. And that is where the challenge is. And I, I hear you. I know what you're saying. But there has to be hope. We have to keep at it. We do have to keep at it. Yeah. And we have, to, we have to also ensure that our institutions are holding those who, who don't embody this stuff um to account right people need to see that if you if you act in a racist manner that's your job that's your livelihood that that and we're, we are starting to see those things you know i think you know for some people it feels like much but i think people have to start to see the repercussions of their actions they can't just act with a carte blanche thank you